для приветственного слова. Very good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'll read out now the greeting, greetings from the President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin. Dear friends, a warm welcome on the occasion of the opening of the Gaidar Forum. Congratulations on the 10th anniversary since it, its inception. In the course of these years, the Gaidar Forum has served as a most of the highest profile discussion platforms to talk key social and economic challenges and issues of today and come up with promising ways of how to resolve these. It has grasped the attention of Russian national scholars, politicians, entrepreneurs and mass media, shaping uh, intense and relevant agenda. I believe that the topic of today's forum, Russia in the World, National Goals and, and uh, National Development Goals and Global Trends, is highly relevant. I am sure that the idea to come up with recommendations of the uh, forum meeting will serve the resolution of the strategic goals our country is facing to enhance its role in integration, development, and national econ economic uh, technology and investment development and cooperation. I wish you fruitful work and deliberations. President Vladimir Putin. Thank you so much. Uh, First Deputy Prime Minister, I'd like to seize the opportunity and thank Mr. Silano for all the arrangements be in his capacity of the chair of the organizing committee and the name of the forum, by the way, belongs to Mr. Siloanov. I mean I mean the topic of today's uh, forum, uh, National Development Goals and Global Trends, which is dear friends. As Mr. President has noted in the greetings, our forum has turned 10 years, and 10 years ago we were convened here, and today we are convening for the first event in, in this year to discuss the global challenges and the upcoming challenges, and today we are marking our anniversary. All of us mark their own anniversaries every now and then they we may rejoice or not in in the economic sphere everything is not that cloudless uh, 10 years ago the global downturn began which is bad news but the good news is that we have been marking 20 years since the euro the euro was introduced and 30 years ago the po post communist era began for our countries so we're having a unique panel composition today. Yeah. Paula Risiko, Speaker of the Parliament of Finland. Prior to that, she served as the Welfare and Health Care Minister of Finland and Interior Minister Friedrich Vidal, Minister of Higher Education, Research and Innovation of the French Republic. She has become Minister. Prior to that, she had at Nietzsche Sophia Antipolis University. And Frederick, I'm thankful to her. She was one of the sponsors of creating of the Russian French University. She was the first president of that university. And Emmanuel Macron, back then the uh, economy minister, made up his mind to establish this university. Arman Shanmugaratnam, deputy prime minister and coordinating minister for economic and social policy of Singapore, a good connoisseur of Russian economic history. I will add, I did economic history as well, so I know what I'm speaking about. We also have two countries that merited everybody's attention in the past 10 years of the global economic downturn. Italy and Greece were on the forefront of the euro battle, and the, few, and the fate of euro was uh, defined there. Giovanni Trier, Minister of Economy and Finance of the Italian Republic, so he is a professor. Professor Trier, for a number of years, headed the National Public Governance School of Italy, which is our sister 
University in Italy. He used to be the Dean of Economic Faculty, of Economic Department of the Roman Institute. And uh, Professor Lucas Papadamos, a uh, renowned academic, uh, honorary governor of the Bank of Greece, the former Prime Minister of Greece. So, as we can see, all the panelists do occupy or did occupy key positions in the government, and they did practical things when time was high for reforms, for, for real, serious, and tangible reforms. They all have very good, unique track record, and I believe this makes this panel makeup quite unique and special. So I would suggest the following procedure for the discussion. I would ask one question to all of the colleagues, and I would uh, give one or one and a half minutes for this quick fire to each of you. I believe it's going to be much more dynamic uh, in this vein. And afterwards, we'll give more detailed answers on this uh, particulars of the reforms that you did and other things that you delivered. So the first question is the question to everybody, and please uh, provide uh, like short answers, no more than a minute uh, long. What are the main problems and challenges of socio-economic development for the upcoming five to seven years? And a specific economic question. Now the economic scholars discuss the uh, timeline for the new crisis, is whether it's going to arrive in 2019 or 2020, whether it's going to erupt shortly or it will not come at all. So whether we should expect this new crisis, what the risks are? The first to answer would please be Taman Shanmugratnam, Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore. So a minute uh, for you to respond. The risks, the trends and whether we wait for the crisis. Thank you, Professor Mao. Um, I think, truthfully, uh, no one knows uh, when the next crisis will come or where it will come from. But it will become a truly global crisis if we do not have global order. And our biggest risk today is not in financial crises or economic crises. Our big biggest risk is the gradual weakening and fragmentation of the global order. Uh, it has come about because of two challenges. The first challenge is that we now have a multipolar world, which is in many ways a positive development, but multipolarity uh, has meant decentralization of decision-making at a time when the global economy and the global financial markets are ever more connected. So we have the paradox of ever more connected global markets, but increasingly decentralized economic decisions. The second challenge is that national policies and globalization are not reinforcing each other in a positive way, but in a negative way. Weak national responses to globalization and technological change are undermining domestic trust, trust in institutions, which are in turn undermining faith in the global order. This is not without solution. There are solutions. There's nothing inevitable in this. There are solutions, and it means that we need to make sure that a decentralized system can be resilient and can be coherent, and it is possible. And we need to make sure that you have strong national policies for inclusive growth that support openness and globalization. And we need global initiatives and global cooperation that support national efforts for inclusive growth. It can, it can be done. And I would just add that we've just had a G20 eminent persons group with a whole set of recommendations that try to advance this agenda. Uh, Thank, Thank you, Professor Papadamus, a minute or something for you. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, let me say that I would like to first uh, thank you for inviting me to the Gaider Forum, 
which uh, this year celebrates uh, its 10th anniversary. Now, we are living in challenging and uncertain times for the global economy and for policymakers. And I think the challenges are very much related to various factors, processes, and tensions that are shaping global economic activity. And uh, they are also related to the extraordinary degree of uncertainty which is characterizing policy, both at the national level and the international level, as well as to several risks that are weighing on global economic growth. Now, the general challenge that we face is how to effectively address the expected consequences of some of these processes and trends, including the effects of globalization, including the effects of rapid technological innovation, as well as divergent demographics that creating tensions and lead to migrant flows in various parts of the world as well as uh, to address the uncertainties associated with rising trade tensions and what appears to be a questioning of the framework of international policy cooperation. Now, since the time is very limited, let me say that what I see as the main challenges today is, first of all, to address the expected slowdown of global growth which is projected to be greater than expected a few months ago, both in advanced economies and in emerging economies. And in order to do that, it is important on one hand to implement aggregate demand policy that will support activity over the medium term, but also to enact the reforms that are necessary in order to, to, en to enhance potential growth, which both in particularly in advanced economies, but also in some emerging economies, is expected to decline over the next five years. Now, to this end, it's important to avoid an escalation of trade tensions. This is another challenge. And also to ensure, as I said before, that the international framework for international policy cooperation is functioning efficiently and productively. And finally, if I can add two things that are a little bit more region or country specific, but they are things they are affecting many countries in the world. It is important to address the rising inequality of income, which uh, has been considerable in many advanced economies, and it is fueling the populist movements that may imply, that may have adverse consequences on economic policy. And also to address in an effective manner the migration flows, which are partly a consequence of divergent demographics and divergent economic conditions in different regions, but also reflect geopolitical tensions. And these flows could have effect both on the economics and the politics. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you so much. Of the microphones. Tarman. Thank you. Professor Pierre, please. Uh, okay. <clears throat> thank you, Director Mao. I, I want to thank you for the invitation. Just to answer your question, I think that in the next years, I see two main challenges at the global level, but also at the European level. The first one is how to avoid social instability. The second is how to avoid financial instability. The two challenges are linked because they come from the same sources. I think that. The, failure, the first one is that the failure in governing the growing inequalities produced by some undesirable characteristics of the contemporary globalization. The second one is the fear of financial instability shared by multilateral institutions and also by European Union. And this fear impaired to look at both the problems together, social and financial instability. The result is that we are feeding, as a consequence, 
other risks, increasing sentiment against free trade and globalization, protectionism, potential financial instability coming from the growing debt of emerging and developing countries, new flows of migrants from developing countries to advanced countries, and also a potential <coughs> collapse of European Union if its policy continue to create divergence and not convergence between member states. All these risks can bring to more conflicts, even if the real solution should be more cooperation. Thanks. Uh, Thank you so much. A minute and a half now for Professor Vidal. As we are within the confines of a university, I would term the ministers and prime ministers as Professor. So, Professor Vidal. Thank you very much. First of all, I, I, I wish to tell you, oh, please, uh, I am to be here today, and I have already had the pleasure to give a speech at the Gaida Forum when I was a president of the University of Nice, and I returned today as minister and I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here because I am attached today, as I was yesterday, to the links between France and Russia. I think that one of the main risks for the future is the lack of well-trained human resources with right skills, right competencies, and the capability to adapt and to understand the world. Um, one major scientific challenge, and its probably main impact on education and society, uh, will be uh, artificial intelligence. And I think that we, we can also have a strong cooperation on that topic. And we also need to have one major transformation it is to support innovation coming from research and, uh, and from students. I want to say that for me, future is to be smart because we are facing huge challenges and that's why education must be at the heart of our priorities because we have to give new definitions for education and higher education, how to learn, but also how to be and how to act. And uh, for me, it is essential because we are facing huge and global challenges such as climate, migration, energy, but we also have to find global solutions, but also local solutions. And of course, we have to support science and technology, but also we have to involve human and social sciences in order to define the world we want for the future and in order to avoid social instability. Thank you so much. Now, Paula Risico. I would ask you to comment on what has been said or probably at the outset respond to the question on the risks and global challenges and how you see them, madam, and uh, then res and then here be the first one to start talking after this quickfire answer, to start talking straight away about this welfare sphere issues. We know that the human capital is a priority in today's world and its development, like education and healthcare, matter a lot, and the digital technology is, being, is transforming a lot. Uh, and new challenges appear, and the social and welfare state as is said now, is going through a crisis and should be transformed, as many people say, and it has a bearing on the education and health care. And here at this forum we discuss different ways and means of uh, uh, delivering the national priorities in the presidential decree of President Putin as of the 7th of May. And education and health care have the central 
central pieces there, central positions there, central roles, and we speak about the economy a lot. We know what is health care in a not too well-to-do country, but what about Finland, which is quite a well-to-do nation? So will you will you speak about global challenges and mention the uh, the Finnish experience experience as well? Professor Mau, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for these questions. I will focus on three issues concerning global trends and risks, uh, and, uh, which are very important in my opinion. Transformation of international system, clim climate change and demography. Transformation of international system is a process that uh, brings a lot of uncertainty for all of us. The rule-based global system is under threat of being replaced by fragmented world. There seems to be less value in cooperation and more value in confrontation. An obvious common goal uh, is the fight against climate change, which is my second point. In the recent poll, this was the top concern of Finnish citizens ahead of terrorism and migration. There should be no illusion, Ill, Ill, illusions. There are no winners in climate change. Thirdly, I would like to mention the risk related to demography. Actually, it is a two sides uh, risk, which make it even worse. In many developing countries, populations uh, still grow too fast at least much too fast for the economics to cope with it. At the same time, in most developed countries, we have the opposite problem. Populations grow too slowly or even decline. Third rates are declining. It is a major challenge for the economy and society. This all uh, sounds quite gloomy. The positive side is that we have the tools to answer these challenges. We have to get to agree on UN Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. We have a Paris Climate Agreement. The question is, are we able to use these tools efficiently? I would like to end my asthma uh, this question uh, by saying that, that we know the problems, we know the tools, so, at least we know, but solutions, sol solutions must be found. Concerning correlation between health and economy uh, prosperity, I would like to ta start my underlining the fact that we should not at all look at health as a separate issue. Finland has adopted a whole of government approach which includes health in all policies at the national level. This means that all government ministries have to consider health aspect in policy development. At local level, we do the same. I would like to mention the project where the number of overweight children has cut to half by focusing on what they eat and how much they exercise. Throughout this approach, we are aiming at an integrated view of health and health as a strong contributor to the prosperous welfare state. One of the key issues for the public economy is the aging population. In Finland, the rate of aging is the highest in Europe. Since the last reform, there is no longer a single retirement age in Finland. The basic principle is that the longer an individual works, the higher the monthly pension will be. In 2017, the majority of those who retired did it at 63 years of age. Aging population demands specific health policies and solutions. For example, we have created a network of senior city citizens' welfare centers. There is a clear relationship between health and economic prosperity. One of the key indicators is the correlation between life expectancy uh, and CDP. In most countries, there is a positive correlation between these two. This goes for Finland as well. According to research, 
high income, well educated and employment employed citizens are in better health than their lower earning, less educated and unemployed fellow citizens. There are many reasons behind the correlation, correlation uh, between health and income levels. They can be related to selection, to differences in access to health care, to variation in health behavior, to environmental factors, to lifestyle, and to factors associated to low income, such as stress. Even more importantly, these studies also point to uh, reverse causality. Poor health may lead to unemployment, which in turn leads uh, to lower earnings, and on the other hand, low earnings and unemployment may again lead to poorer health for the individual. Just be based on research, I'm convinced that there is a strong link between economic prosperity and health, and that this link works both sides and both ways. Good health improves economic performance and poor health leads to declining economic performance. There cannot be a healthy state with unhealthy population. Naturally, it is not news that there is value for the government to improve the health of citizens. I would like to expand that argument and claim that health should increasingly be seen as an investment and not as an expense. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to point out to highlight something. We, we've just heard what Madam Risico has said. Not just the healthcare ministry should look into health. It should be the area of responsibility of all ministries and agencies, and that is a very interesting idea. And I say that in the presence of social ministers, economic development ministers who are here in the audience. That is very important. Professor Vidal, dear Frederick, how do you view the key trends and global challenges in education? You, you, you say that this stands into a global issue. This morning, at a breakfast dedicated to education, a big entrepreneur said that in future, efficient startups will appear in the field of education, that there are going to be new platform solutions in education. And this is also going to be very great from the point of view of business. It'll have a great capitalization. Do you think this is going to undermine the positions of traditional universities? Is it a global university trend? Right now, France, as far as I understand, pursues the area of strengthening universities, and that is a trend very close to us. But how does it fit into the global picture right now? Thank you very much. Yes, of course. In fact, we are convinced that to face global challenges, we, we have to use the best of each discipline and um, in order to, to help new researchers uh, to use or to, to be able to understand um, all the disciplines, it is very important to support higher education and very good skills and very good knowledge in each discipline, but also to have interface between this, these disciplines. Because to solve the challenges, we need to, to ask the best of, uh, of each uh, disciplines. And I'm really speaking about science and, and technology, and, uh, but also uh, about uh, social science, sciences, and I think it, it is really very, very important. So we have to find a way to create new bridges between disciplines, and this can be done uh, within comprehensive universities or within a network of universities that can work together um, in order to, to, to better uh, educate new uh, students and, and, and new researchers. Um, of course, this has a very strong impact on the way to think uh, education. First of all, 
most of the students are now what we call digital natives, and they are able to concentrate, concentrate for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and they are used to have a lot of information um, coming from uh, different uh, parts of, uh, of uh, internet and, and so on. And we, we must help them to learn how to learn. And I think that this is now the main point, and that's why it is also very important to change our mind about um, pedagogy and about education. We also know that um, uh, students uh, want uh, to learn by doing things, and it is very important to also think uh, about uh, how we can um, um, doing more things uh, by a project approach and mixing uh, students coming from, uh, from different uh, disciplines. Of course, um, artificial intelligence is also very important in, in that topic because we can also uh, see what is the best time for students to learn things regarding their own uh, physiology, I must say, or, or uh, what is the best time in the day to have uh, their attention on this, uh, this specific um, uh, learning skills. And we can use, of course, uh, digital to have more massive education, but we must use the time um, that to, the, we, can, we can use this time uh, to have more um, interpersonal relationship between professors and students. And this is also uh, very, very, uh, very, very important. The third thing is uh, to support um, innovation and to support curiosity and to support entrepreneurship for students. And this is also a, a new way um, of learning, but also a new way of teaching. Uh, we have to mix um, academic education and, uh, and social projects or technical projects for students. And we need to have more uh, engineers and managers. We need to have more soft skills in the scientific um, education, and, and we need to have maybe more science uh, in, um, in humanities, because it is very important that all the students uh, will have education in, in, in digital training, because the world in which we, we will live uh, in the 21st century will be a world, a digital world more and more, and it is very important that all people are understanding what does it mean in order to avoid to be afraid of uh, this kind of, of world and to have the opportunity to, to use the best of this digital world. Thank you very much, Madam Vidal. I cannot but point out something. I did mention that, but Professor Vidal, in terms of her doctorate, uh, she, she, she is a biologist, and Madame Vidal has talked about linking humanities and sciences, and this digital age is of great importance. This is a thesis that I'd like to highlight. Right now, I would like to give the floor to Professor Trier. I'd like to ask you about your view at the global trends from the Italian perspective and from the perspective of the European Union. What does Italy think about globalization? Or to be more precise, we had this European design style in Russia, which was very popular in the 90s. Isn't it time to adapt the European institutions to new challenges that emerge? Thank you. I think that when we look at Europe, 
we have to look at the global economic picture around Europe. And when we look at the global economic picture today, uncertainty is the key word that comes to our mind. Just until a year ago, the world was enjoying a synchronized economic acceleration. Now, the state of the world economy has changed and we experience an uneven moment, momentum and uh, difficulties in coordinating also monetary policies. We notice the American protectionist priorities. We notice the Chinese strategy to gain influence abroad and to challenge the American technological hegemony. As a, result, as a result, we observe an increasing tension on trade, but also signs of a Cold War that not so long ago we thought was definitely, definitely over. To sum up this global picture, we see that hegemonic strategies are taking advantage over collaborative ones. This can be seen as the results of the two major phenomena that we are facing. The first one is globalization. We can say that globalization is a good thing. It is, for example, an engine of a provision of a widening range of global public goods and free trade support global growth. But the positive change, however, doesn't come from free. Contemporary globalization is also a powerful engine of economic and social inequalities. Globalization doesn't mean equal participation. In practice, we have a few hegemonic hubs and the income and power are being transferred from local elite to the hegemonic hubs controlling the new networks. This creates a paradox because we have a growth that is a, it's at the same time more inclusive and more unequal. Social compensatory mechanisms don't have the same tendency to become globalized. There is no safety net for temporary losers in the global competition game. New welfare instruments and policies should be designed to address the social ills of the distribution process driven by the new type of wealth and poverty caused by globalized network. Globalization may not imply more innovation on the longer run. We could reach a ceiling in the so-called creative destruction of innovation. The current globalization of the economy can increase the risk implicit in any innovation investment because of the increased speed of technological change. The destructive component of the Schumpeterian competition in this new contest can have a growing negative impact also on the investment decision of potential innovator and investor. The second big phenomenon is the growing competition for technological hegemony between China, Asia, and Asia but mainly China and the United States. This is the real challenges behind the current trade war. And for this reason, the prevalence of hegemonic strategies and not of collaborative strategies, I think is particularly dangerous. Because in 200 years, we have seen an economic growth and then a decline of the relative economic importance of Europe and in general Western countries, mirrored respectively by a decline and then a growth of the relative economic importance of southern and eastern regions of the world. History teaches us that these shifts occurred amidst the conflict in the world. While these shifts appear inevitable, our biggest effort today as Europeans should be to govern the present shift in order to ensure that fair competition always prevails over conflict but in this global picture where, where Europe stands. We are celebrating in Europe 
the 20th anniversary of our single currency, the euro. These 20 years are marked by two distinct phases, a successful first decade and a troubled second one. The second decade showed a deterioration of the euro area performance, which eroded the political and social consensus. To conclude on this point, we trust the trust we put in our single currency doesn't prevent us from asking if the policies supporting the euro after 20 years have promoted convergence or, on the contrary, have fueled the divergence among its member economies, as I said before. Now we focus, but what do we argue? Do we argue continuously about in Europe? We focus on Brexit, but we should do something different than fighting for the room left vacant by the outgoing tenant. We see migration issues only as a repartition puzzle, and we have an obsession on procedures while we don't dare looking at the bigger picture. What we are not doing is developing a coherent strategy to build back our technological sovereignty. What we are not doing is picture ourselves on the global stage 15 or 12 years from now. What we are not doing is give ourselves, ourselves the means to be competitive on the world stage while respecting our common values. What we are not doing is bring back into the productive social fabric millions of people that were put aside by the crisis and suffer from the poverty. This is why 10 years on from the financial crisis, we still have not figured out what we need to do. Uh, thank you, and uh, quite soon, within a few minutes, the Prime Minister will join us, so I will have to interrupt and greet him, but now I'd like to ask Professor Papadamos to con continue to follow up on the uh, future of Europe and uh, the Euro future, the Euro fate. For us, it is a very important global topic, as each and every global crisis led to a new architecture of global currencies. The pound gave way to the USD in the 1930s, then the double reserve uh, system after the 1970s. What comes next? Our central bank is now restructuring its currency in forex reserves, increasing the euro share and definitely we keep asking ourselves ourselves what the future of euro is as well as the future of RMB and the cryptocurrencies future so professor papadamus the future of uh, eu and the future of euro your perspective well these are two uh uh, challenging questions that will require a fair amount of time to respond. So F let me five minutes. focus uh, uh, primarily on uh, the future of Euro. As you all know, uh, two weeks ago, on January 1st, the Euro celebrated its 20th anniversary. And this provides a good occasion to assess whether over the past 20 years it has achieved its objectives of maintaining price stability, supporting economic growth, and uh, protecting financial and macroeconomic stability. My view, and I don't think I'm biased, is that overall the mission was accomplished effectively. However, having said that, and looking towards the future, I would like to point out that the 20th anniversary of the Euro is also not an occasion for exuberant and conditional celebration. Because macroeconomic and financial stability were protected and the, current, and the crisis was addressed, but often with implementation of policies that implied serious economic and social cost in member states, including my own. And during the dark periods of the crisis, the viability of the euro was tested and was questioned by many. So, looking ahead, 
I think there are three important issues that have to be addressed. The first is, can the euro deal effectively with a potential new crisis if it happens? I'm not predicting that it will, but it's important that the euro is in a position to address more effectively and, and, and uh, efficiently another financial and economic turbulence. Second, can the euro foster more stronger economic growth and a reduction in unemployment which continues to be at a very high level and also contribute to lessen income inequality? And third, what can be done in order to secure the viability of the euro? And I think uh, my answer to these three questions is a conditional one. My answer would, to all of them would be yes, provided the appropriate policies are implemented at the national level and also at the European level. And focusing on the latter and concluding, I believe it is important for the performance of the euro area economy and for the long-term viability of the euro that important informs are implemented in order to complete and reinforce economic and monetary union, in order to adapt the economic policy framework so that it has a greater European orientation and strengthen what we could call the economic and fiscal pillars of economic and monetary union together with the political foundations. As probably many of you know, over the past three years, there have been a number of proposals to this end, including a report by the five presidents of the European institutions, and also quite important, I believe, are the positions of the president of the French Republic, Emmanuel Macron, particularly those that were advanced in his uh, lecture at Sorbonne. However, the progress that has been achieved has been rather slow, because of differences of opinion on the features of the future architecture as well as a result of political developments. But I believe, and I'm concluding, that it is possible to make further progress despite political difficulties in a number of countries and the rise of populism, nationalism and Euroscepticism if the actions that are taken will address issues, first of all, that are important for the European citizens, and issues that can be addressed more effectively at the European level rather than at the national level. Some form of fiscal union, I believe, is necessary in order to ensure the viability of the euro, but I fully acknowledge that this is a potentially difficult step because issues relating to fiscal policy, which involve spending and taxation to finance and spending, have important and deep political dimensions. Nevertheless, I think this is an indispensable step and I believe there is a scope for taking it by again focusing on policies, including enhancing infrastructure, addressing the technological innovation issues that will provide the basis for such a common fiscal stance. My final remark, uh, Mr. Chairman, is to conclude with an optimistic note that despite the challenges and difficulties that we're facing in the euro area and relating to the functioning of the European Monetary Union, I believe that these difficulties will be overcome for two reasons. One, first, that the majority of the euro area public is still supporting the European project and the euro currency in particular. And second, because I believe that in a number of countries where there has been increasing populism and skepticism, the politicians will realize that when, if they face further the dilemma of staying or exiting the euro area, they will arise, they will realize the catastrophic consequences of such an exit and they will respect the will of the people. I see, bro. So I believe that the euro will be forever and this will be good not only for the euro area, but also for Europe at large, including the Russian Federation. Thank you so much. And the Prime Minister of the Russian Federation, Dmitry Medvedev, is joining us now. Let's applaud and greet him.
Prime Minister, we just had a discussion on the welfare and social issues. We discussed the future of Europe. In the, in the past two statements by the Italian uh, Honorable Econ Economic Minister and the Honorary Governor of Central Bank of Greece, uh, they were critical but at the same time optimistic about the future euro so we, probably we are right in reconfiguring our forex reserves and increasing the share of euro therein and now i'd like to ask mr taman Shan, shanmu garatnam to respond on the following we had a global discussion with a focus with a special focus on the euro but we know the that the east comes from light as the bible said and many people believe that the Asian tigers and Asian countries will become the powerhouse of the global economy. At the same time, we recall the Asian crisis that was 20 years ago. It originated in Europe. So, distinguished Tarman, do you believe that the powerhouse is powerful enough, whether it, it, it has long, a lot of staying power and whether light will come from Asia or another crisis? And, uh, you know, Singapore is, um, is, is a very innovative country. I'm going to use cryptocurrencies in Singapore. Thank you. Um, well, first, there is a shift, of course, of global economic activity to Asia, largely for demographic reasons, and because Asia's, Asian countries have got their economic policies uh, roughly right. But I would uh, uh, caution against thinking that Asia is the source of uh, solutions for the world uh, or is the source of uh, light, as you say. Um, Asia has got economic policies roughly right, particularly the progressive opening up of economies and taking advantage of globalization. But I would not say that Asia, by and large, uh, has a equitable and sustainable social contract in its various countries. And at the end of the day, uh, we eat each of our country's needs, both a social contract that's equitable and sustainable and economies that are vibrant and innovative. And the two things tend to go together in the long run. So I would look at Asia for specific innovations and social policy solutions, just like Asia has to look at the rest of the world for those solutions. For instance, what I was listening to our Finnish colleague talking about um, the problems of demographics and aging. I find very interesting what Japan is doing to increase participation in the workforce of older workers, which is what our Finnish colleague was doing. Very interesting innovations. Uh, also some very interesting technological innovations in healthcare uh, to take care of the elderly, even with a manpower shortage. Um, Singapore has some interesting solutions in housing and the way we plan our urban neighborhoods so as to enhance social integration and so on and so forth. Russia has some interesting solutions. I visited uh, uh, Skolkovo Innovation Center, Inopolis. There's so much we can learn from each other. So we should avoid thinking of one country or one region as superior or a source of light for the others but look for specific solutions which we can learn from each other and increase our engagement with each other. Thank you so much. What about cryptocurrencies? Well, I, I would say, uh, first, we should not uh, form our conclusions on the whole issue of digitalization of finance too quickly. Uh, most of cryptocurrency transactions today uh, are used for, I would say, bad things. It's either money laundering or terrorism financing or various other things that are beneath the surface of modern economies. That's what most of the transactions are about. However, the technologies underpinning many of these digital tokens, and I prefer to call them digital tokens, uh, blockchain, various other technologies are worth watching and allowing, let's allow for some innovation and see how they can be useful in strengthening financial inclusion in the developing world, how they can be useful in reducing the cost and increasing the convenience 
of financial transactions, including payments, and other areas. So we should keep an open mind, but I think uh, there's uh, been a bit too much excitement about cryptocurrencies per se. Okay, the conclusion from the final three interventions is that we can increase the share of euro, but we shouldn't increase uh, the share of cryptocurrencies in our forex reserves. We shouldn't include the uh, cryptocurrencies. Mr. Prime Minister, will you comment, uh, to comment or to, to intervene with a statement? Let, let me probably first uh, deliver my speech. Commenting, you know, is like a short intervention, and uh, the speech prepared for me is more fundamental. But still now I'd like to draw your attention a bit from the debates and talk some of the things that I believe are of uh, paramount importance to a certain extent. In my speech, I will overlap with the panelists that have commented on the current trends. Any, anyway, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I thank the organizers for the in invitation to speak at this 10th anniversary Gaida Forum and recalling the, the topic of the first conference, Russia in the World, challenges of the new decade. Indeed, those challenges have now come to the fore. This decade brought in a lot of challenges, partly predictable, but to some extent unexpected. In terms of their scope, both developed and developing countries are facing these challenges, countries with different social structures and political architectures, and the global economy by and large. In terms of the scope of these challenges, these are unparalleled. And uh, most importantly, the uncertainty is so high, impacting all the facets of uh, public life. And the pace and scale of digital transformation hold huge potential and is fraught with considerable risks, including the need for practical and constant continuous infrastructure modernization, which is quite costly, but at the same time we should earmark funds for that global changes in conventional markets and appearance of new ones, primarily I'm talking about the overhaul about the energy, of the energy market structure, more energy efficient energy sources come to the fore and uh, we, we can see greater competition and rise in protectionism. And I could continue in this vein, vein and uh, definitely environmental issues are quite acute. If we speak about the social things more profound is the social inequality, provoking massive discontent in even well-to-do countries. And that may rise further because of the new problems in employment, unfair distribution of benefits from the uh, expanded global trade, discrepancy of the weight, of the growing weight of the developing countries and their participation in defining the rules of international uh, trade. You know, but uh, the things haven't, haven't yet moved off. And these proportions keep growing and bulging out. The challenges I have enumerated give rise to new ones. All those things related to smart things and digital twins, unmanned vehicles, 3D technologies in construction and production. All that requires brand new approaches and management of personnel training and free access to information requires a new better level of protection of privacy and public security. Here we can see huge new potential and definitely at the same time, hand in hand, we see huge risks. 
And, uh, you know, the statistics is now gridlocked. Everybody keeps asking how we should reckon the GDP and whether it's a proper yardstick for the economic development. Shouldn't we scrap it all together, some people say? What parameters do we need to reflect the current states of the economy? What uh, changes should we have in customs statistics and the regulator keep having and facing new problems? What to do with the payment systems and cryptocurrencies? And uh, uh, the panelists have just now touched upon this topic. And definitely the past year, if we speak about cryptocurrencies, and uh, let me comment on the huge number of questions about cryptocurrencies, it all demonstrated the the high degree of volatility, the exceptional volatility of cryptocurrencies. Last year, at the Gaida Forum, we spoke about how interesting it all was, but since then, the value of some of the cryptocurrencies plummeted five, five times. It's not definitely a pretext to disregard those. There's the upside and the downside with cryptocurrencies, like with any other phenomena. And definitely, we should just keep a watchful eye on what has been happening with these. Many global trends are only taking shape now, some of, of these are obvious, others are hard to manage, and we cannot assess them properly. No one knows what they're going to lead to. The habitual and conventional models and simulations we used to forecast our lives to for, for 10, 15 or 20 years to come and plan for our future and the future of our kids become less and less practical. This is true because we always keep speaking about our experiences, but these are past experiences and the world has been changing too rapidly and our past conclusions become obsolete and one cannot base future approaches on them. And this common trend shape the global agenda in each and every country has their own priorities and based on that they choose how to achieve these goals. The Russian strategy for the midterm has been formulated by the presidential decree May the 7th, 2018, whereas the tactical steps have been set forth by the main directions for the government for the next six years. We also have national and federal projects which have already been set up by now. They have been adopted and we've got down to implement these projects. Looking at our plans, just succinctly, I can say that we've got ambitious goals and targets, but they're very concrete. Still, we need the resources, the personnel, and the project approach, which helps us not just to oversee how things are going, it helps us adjust things as we go, if need be. That helps us structure very accurately our work aimed at achieving the national development goals. We're not just taking advantage of our strong suits, we also transform the global trends into new sources of growth. I believe the experts and everyone else who is here in the audience, the government officials, will agree with my assessment of these trends because they are obvious. No surprise, even in countries which uh, perform quite well in terms of growth, which are leading in terms of the sentiments of monetary and economic policies, still in the mood of the business, we see a great deal of caution. The head of the Fed, the U.S. Fed, has compared the economic policy with the actions of a man who's entered the room, in which all of a sudden the light has gone out. I would like to draw your attention to one important moment. I think colleagues have mentioned that already. On the one hand, such a great level of uncertainty in the global economy and in national economies as due to objective reasons, that is due to the unprecedented pace of technological development, this is what we have to pay for the technological progress. On the other hand, it was a deliberate action. I refer to the aggressive uh, policy, political and economic pressure policy, which has been equipped recently by a number of countries. I refer to illicit sanctions, the power-based 
economic negotiations, the detention of uh, foreign entrepreneurs, bans slapped on the purchases of foreign goods, and these actions and sanctions are covering not just certain countries. Several years ago, when I spoke about that, I meant just Russia, but right now the situation is far more menacing because these actions cover many countries, and that means thousands of entrepreneurs and banks. And this is not just about the sanctions. It is about an attempt at trying to restructure the whole world trade architecture to pander to uh, someone's interests. That is an attempt to seize the global financial architecture through the use of uh, the country's position as the global issuer of currency. And the country I'm referring to is boosting its public debt, and everyone knows that very well. The goal is to shift the internal political and economic risks on the shoulders of other participants of the world economy. Let me remind you that in the second half of the 20th century, during the troubled times for the international monetary system, a representative of the United States of America, Treasury Ministry uh, Secretary, uh, Mr. Connolly, said something that has become a classic. He said, the dollar is our currency, but it is your problem. Unfortunately, over the last half a century, this position remains more or less unchanged and everyone understands that there is a truth to this saying still. We still have to deal with the exorbitant privilege of the dollar, something spoken about by President Vary Giscard d'Estaing. The country whose currency is a key reserve currency destroys the trust, the confidence in this very currency itself. And this is a paradox. The idea of de-dollarization is boosted by the issue of this very currency. And I mentioned the light that has gone out in the room that was mentioned by the head of the Fed, but the light has not just gone out, it has been switched off by the person to whom this room belongs. And this is something we all have to deal with. We have to respond to that. Unfortunately, we cannot call such a policy an acceptable one, an admissible one. Sometimes responses have to be made on the go, and there are issues involved in that. But in order to act, we don't need for something to wait for something to happen. Russia and the European Union have been talking about how we can shield our economic ties with Iran against sanctions. Uh, this need has a reason because both Europe and Russia give the same assessment to the U.S. withdrawal from the Iranian nuclear deal and uh, the assessment of the consequences of that. There are measures to help our enterprises and we see growing risks in the dollar zone. As you know, we are trying to expand the use of the ruble as well as other currencies in our external transactions. We have decreased our investment into the U.S. Treasury bonds. Incidentally, the recent issuance of Russian euro bonds was denominated in euro. This is all due to the aggressive and I would go as far as to say senseless economic policy pursued by the U.S. Evidently, the trend toward trying to decrease the dependency of national economies on the dollar is only going to persist and to decode because the most active, the, the strongest player in the world economy is acting in a way that it only fuels the tension. But there are structural issues both Russia and other countries are faced with. There are three that I'd like to point out. First, addressing the infrastructure challenge. There are not that many countries in the world that wouldn't call infrastructure development as one of their priorities. Sometimes we see such a phenomenon as excessive infrastructure development. For such a big country as Russia, a complex country too, the modernization of infrastructure, both transportation infrastructure, energy, information, social infrastructure, is of paramount importance. In terms of uh, leveling the development level, the standards of living, and also in terms of our participation in global transportation and logistics, 
projects. We have a separate plan to develop our main rounds, and until 2024, we plan to use different sources, and we're going to spend up to 6 trillion rubles, that is around 100 billion US dollars, more or less, until 2024, from the budget and from extra budgetary sources. We also have other national projects to develop our social infrastructure. We, we emphasize the efficient use of this money. We also try to attract private investment, and we're trying to create a conducive business environment. Despite the evident success that we've managed to achieve, there is still a long way to go in Russia. Let me dwell a little bit on one of the most acutest aspects. I refer to control and oversight. Until now, the number of the so-called mandatory requirements we have for businesses during inspections is uh, too high, and there is no justification for that. The number of these regulations stands at more than 9,000. The number is enormous. Many of them have been passed down to us from the Soviet times, and they are both obsolete and obsolescent. Sometimes they seem even ludicrous. And that would be funny had it been with the fact that they limit the development. In terms of sanitary and epidemiological regulation, for instance, there is a requirement which is still in place for restaurants and cafes. There is a need to inspect how big is the and how thick is the powder, the egg powder. So when an omelette has been prepared, and that is the text of this regulation, this mixture of egg or egg powder with other components is put on a pan. Its thickness has to be 2.5 or 3 centimeters, and then it's put into the oven. So you, you have to remember that the requirement is still in place. You, you have to remember how thick it should be. It's ludicrous, but it's still in place, and there is something that has to be done about it. If we want to address the issue of a technological leap breakthrough, we have to decrease the burden our entrepreneurs are faced with. We have to revisit the regulations in such over-regulated sectors as transport, environment, industrial safety, veterinary, sanitary, and epidemiological regulations. And this issue can be addressed with the mechanism of the so-called regulatory guillotine. What is this guillotine about? All the regulations that have obligatory requirements, if they're not going to be reapproved or revisited, will automatically expire. This will help us slash inefficient or excessive regulations. In accordance with this mechanism, by February the 1st, 2020, we will have been able to revisit all these regulations, trying to adapt them to the realities of today. We've got a very good experience in that regard in our Russian Amacom. It was applied to fire safety. It was applied back in 2008. There was a special federal law on the technical regulations. It was very, very difficult, very complicated. Yesterday, I brought together all the heads of oversight and regulatory agencies, and they told me that this is something they were willing to do. Well, of course, if the necessary preparations are made, and we, we still need a certain bulk of regulations to remain, so we need a roadmap in order to achieve that. And what is the outcome? The outcome is the regulations that are going to be clear-cut the minimum we need to act efficiently, and it'll help us boost economic growth on the one hand and ensure the safety of consumers. And I would like to request the government to prepare a roadmap to support this work of ours. The second challenge our country is facing is the industrial revolution and the development of digital technologies. No doubt, 
This is a theme that requires a separate discussion, but today I'd like to point out something that helps us understand, grasp the scale of the changes that transpired. The digital agenda is truly international right now. We need digital standards and rules, e-commerce, uh, protection of personal data. That requires collaboration and concerted action. Just as many other countries, Russia designates digitalization as one of our national development priorities. The starting point, to be honest, is not that bad if we compare the level of development of our country and that of others. And yet we, we see a certain digital divide in terms of certain Russian regions and industries. We have leading companies. On the other hand, a number of uh, businesses are still only observers, not active participants of this process. Another issue that I can mention at RANIPA, the Russian Academy for Public Service, we, we, we see a shortage of competences and governments and, and municipalities and certain branch ministries in law enforcement, around one million specialists. That is what we need, uh, that we need to retrain, no less than that. I don't know how precise that number is, but I think it is more or less fair. And the thing is, what we have to teach these specialists it's very complex because it develops at such a high speed. And this is the challenge the whole education system is facing. Very often, students and professors speak different languages virtually. And certainly, this is something we have to point out not just to the students, but to their professors, to those who teach them. The third issue is the radical transformation of the labor market and the concomitant changes in social sphere. Many experts say that there is a crisis of traditional employment because there is a colossal unemployment rate among low qualified and mid qualified employers. Yes, platform technologies can help those who've found themselves without a job because they open up unlimited opportunities for employment. You can be employed in different forms. I refer in particular to remote employment, part-time employment, and the third thing is self-employment. And there are a number of acute issues many countries are facing. How can we include all the citizens in the new technological wave? How can we secure and ensure the rights of those who are not covered by the social security system due to the development of technologies? What is happening and going to happen to the social security system itself as these trends go forward. How is it to be modernized? How to transform the taxation system to, to adapt to these changes? These are just questions to which we do not have clear-cut answers. But as very complex social processes, mass manifestations in particular in France are showing us we have to search for the answers as soon as possible. No doubt, this is something that is very relevant to our country, too. Just in this year, we have introduced a new taxation regime for self-employed. The most important thing about it is that it is of a volunteer, of a voluntary nature. It is very simple because the tax rate is very low and the accounting and registration are very simple, and the terms are going to be stable for the next 10 years at least. It is only in force in several regions, but if it proves itself, it will cover our country as a whole. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, indeed, we have a great deal of common issues to address. In terms of its of their scale, they're often compared to the issues the humanity was faced with uh, early uh, in the 20th century, maybe they are even more acute. But what's clear is we have to work together to address them. We have to do that consistently and pragmatically. We have to search for a sensible compromise to rebuild step by step the trust, mutual trust we have lost. I believe this is the only way forward in order to ensure success in this dynamic and interesting yet so unstable world. The only way of mutual trust will help our joint problems turn into unprecedentedly big 
joint opportunities. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd like to wish the forum a very productive work. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. If you don't mind, let me take stock just briefly. First, everything that you have mentioned is going to be discussed at the forum. Yes, there are a great number of questions that require answers, and almost all of the trends you've mentioned have special dedicated sessions from training the public servants to digital economy. Secondly, you mentioned that, and before you came, we had listened to that during our discussion. Yes, uncertainty is the greatest challenge of our time, and paradoxically, our task is to learn how to manage this uncertainty. This is not just a challenge to uh, our scholars, it is to politicians. And third, the agenda, the state of public management, competences, yes, that is great. But on the other hand, there is the idea of national isolation that is growing and taking hold. And this is yet another paradox between openness and isolation that we have to look at and that we're going to talk about at this forum. And last, you said something about digitalization. Somewhere else, I think, you, you said that it is no less of a breakthrough than the invention of printing. It took 200 years or so to transform everything right now. Everything can be transformed in a blink of an eye. And we all, scholars and those who are more practice oriented, have a lot to discuss and to talk about. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, you end on a positive note. Thank you. Oh, let's go. Thank you.